uh, as we're in this uh, second part of this series that uh, we've called Man Up. And uh, in this series, what we're doing is we're looking at three character qualities that are important for men. And, and what I said last week and then saying this week, really, is that, that these character qualities boys ought to long for, men ought to strive for, and women ought to look for and encourage in men. Now, I'm thrilled that you've come back this week, because uh, if you weren't here last week, there was a lot of circumcision language going around, and I was wondering whether anybody would show up this week, particularly the men. Uh, if you weren't here last week, then you need to go online and watch the message, or order one of the CDs or DVDs of the message. But what we did last week is we, we went to the very beginning of the Bible, and we looked at the origin of circumcision, and the idea that it was God's covenant, that it was God's agreement between him and Abraham that circumcision would be the sign that God would be Abraham's God and the God of his descendants. I, I then talked about a different type of circumcision, a circumcision of the heart that the Bible refers to where God does some cutting and to make us more like him. And as a matter of fact, I put the verse in your outline again that we used last week, Colossians 2 verse 11, which says, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Now, God's dream for us, and, and I've been talking about men in this series, but ladies, as I said last week, you don't get two weeks off, okay? Uh, you can apply these same character qualities in your life. You are just a whole lot better at it than us guys are. But God's dream for us is that he will cut the sin out of our lives that he would circumcise our heart, that he would cut the sin out so that we might look more like him. That's his dream for us. And if we're really honest, that's also our dream for ourselves as well. Now, I believe that when you're a young boy, you have dreams of being a superhero, perhaps, or a sportsman, or a football, or, 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 or something like that. When those dreams of greatness begin to fade, what we do as guys is we buy into a cultural dream. And we buy into a dream that says, here is what a, what a man, here's what a guy is supposed to look like and act and like. And, and we just ad adopt this, this root of malness and we spend the whole of our lives chasing that dream. Culture says, if you are male, you are to be proud and be loud and arrogant and aggressive and abrasive and climb and claw your way to the top. You're to dominate, you're to conquer, you're to be the, the, the King Kong of your world. And you get what you want. You deserve it because you are male. And along the way, you spit and scratch and lift heavy objects. That's what the world says. That pretty much identifies a guy from a world's perspective. And then what we do in our misunderstanding of what a real man is, is that we, what we do as guys is we just blindly, we chase those things. Because we think that's what a real man is. And what I tried to do last week is to say to all of us, but particularly the men, is to stop the chase and bow a knee. That bow a knee was symbolic of humility. That if we're looking at this stereotype of a male, one of the stereotypes is arrogance and pride. But humility is the exact opposite. Humility is not a sign of weakness. As a matter of fact, humility is a sign of strength, a sign of security. Because you can't be humble until you're secure with yourself. Who you are and whose you are. When we act in humility when we take the spotlight off of ourselves and we put the spotlight on other people, humility, we are cooperating while God cuts. And the act of humility is cooperating while God is doing the operating in our hearts. Stop the chase, bow the knee, that's humility. That was step number one. Now this morning I'm going to give you the two other steps, the two other character qualities. Because a second step to someone great and to someone who lives out God's dream is to lend a hand. And that is my phrase, as it were, for serving. That is my phrase for serving. Because serving is one of the ways we cooperate with God operating in our hearts. You see, the cutting of the heart that goes the deepest in a man is when he humbles himself. That is attitude. 
and then serves others. That is action. Humility is attitude. Serving is action. While God is doing the circumcision of our heart, we are, co- we are cooperating through humility and through serving others. Now for me, I don't make you men, but when I hear about this, about serving, when I see opportunities to serve, I don't naturally think, all right, fantastic, that's great, I get to serve. I bet many of you identify with me that, and when there's a need to serve, I don't say, here I am, I can do that, sign me up. What do you want me to do? What comes naturally to me is when I hear about an opportunity to serve, my first response is, not a chance. That's just what comes naturally. Ask somebody else. I'm sure there's somebody else that can do it. That's what comes natural to me. And my battle is always between what comes natural and what I know to be spiritual. That is always the battle in any Christian's life. You know, I talk about this a lot. And the reason I talk about this a lot is because, friends, we, we face this battle every single day of our lives between what we know is spiritual, what God wants us to do, and our natural feelings and what they are. What is natural when it comes to serving? No. Ask somebody else. I'm too busy. I don't want to. What's in it for me? Nothing. Don't want to do it. What's spiritual... I can do that. Let me help you. In fact, it's an honour to serve. I'm called to serve. In fact, I'm obedient to God when I serve. How can I help you? How can I help? How can I be involved? But that doesn't come naturally, does it? Think about this. If I could show you that serving is God's design and desire for you, if I could show you that serving is God's recipe for great relationships, if I could show you that it is the antidote for unhappiness... If I could show you that serving would change your outlook on life, if I could show you that serving is what God ultimately wants for you, would you be interested? Even if it's uncomfortable? I'm betting you would. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to look at the person and teachings of Jesus. And this passage in Matthew 20 is one of those upside-down passages. And what I mean by an upside-down passage is Jesus would very often take things that everybody thought that this was the normal way to do it, and he would flip it upside down. Like, for example, if someone slaps you on your cheek, you don't punch them back. No, Jesus says you turn the other cheek and let them slap that one. That's upside-down thinking. That's countercultural. Uh, if somebody takes you to court and they want your shirt, give them your shirt and give them your jacket too, he says. That's countercultural. That's upside down thinking. Now, in Matthew 20, we've got this argument going on. There's an argument between two brothers, James and John, and here's what they're arguing over. They want greatness. They're arguing over basically the seating arrangements in heaven. That's what they're doing. Uh, Jesus, when we get to heaven, who's going to sit on your left and and who's going to sit on your right? Now, really, what they're doing in today's language is that they're calling shotgun. Uh, Some of you might be aware of that terminology, shotgun. When you call shotgun, you want to sit next to the driver in the car. Um, Well, shotgun hadn't been invited, invented back then, so perhaps they called slingshot, I don't know. But whatever they were doing, they were arguing about who was going to sit next to Jesus in heaven. I want the best seat. And Jesus gets a bit tired of this argument, and so in Matthew 20, 25, 28, he says this. Jesus called all the followers together and he said... You know that the rulers of the non-Jewish people love to show their power over people. Their important leaders love to use all their authority. But it should not be that way among you. Whoever wants to become great among you must serve the rest of you like a servant. Whoever wants to become first among you must serve the rest of you like a slave. In the same way, and just circle those words in that verse, in the same way, the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many people. Now, what I want you to get here about Jesus here is that Jesus does not deny greatness. He just redefines it. He knows. Guys, I I, I know what you're, you're arguing over greatness. I know you want to do something great. I know that. I made you. I created you that way. He doesn't reject greatness. He just redefines it. He does it in one of the most bizarre ways. Talk about upside down. He says, if you want to be great, 
serve. Men, does that shatter your stereotype of a male? Because what we are told as guys is that when you are great, that's when other people serve you. You keep working your way up to the top. You work hard and you work your way up to the top and then pretty soon you have other people working for you and serving you. And if you're a male, you want to be served. That's the pinnacle of maleness, being served. But Jesus shatters that stereotype and he says, you can have greatness. I know it's a desire within you and you get it by serving. Those guys had to be stunned when they heard that. Just like people when they hear this for the first time are stunned, especially guys. The reason I say especially guys is research says that women are three to four times more likely to serve than males. Why? Well, because maybe women are better human beings than us men. Now, ladies, before you get a little bit too smug, let me just remind you of what Eve did and what she did. That was not a great day for females back then, so just don't get too smug, really. But I had you circle those words in the same way. Why? Because I want you to understand that Jesus is saying this about himself. He says, if you want to be great, if you want to be great as God wants you to be great, look at me. Follow my example. Now talk about mind-blowing. Just think about this. Here is Jesus Christ. Here is God in the flesh. And Jesus says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. All the way to give my life on the cross as a ransom for everybody else. Jesus, the King of Kings. You know, kings have servants. The King of Kings, Jesus Christ, says, my life will be characterized by serving. And so to discover how to become great, the followers of Jesus only had to look at Jesus himself. Now remember, you've got this conflict going on between James and John. There's this misunderstanding about how to get greatness. Now if you fast forward several years to where John is now writing some letters, 1, 2, 3 John, he writes in 1 John 2 verse 6 these words, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. That's the same John who was very presumptuous about a seating arrangements in heaven. This is the same John who wanted the best. This is the same John who was so self-centered to say, I want the best seat, I want to sit right next to Jesus. Now the misunderstanding has been removed. It wasn't about manipulating Jesus, it was about emulating him. To walk as Jesus did, he says. Now let's turn this to you now. What does it look like for you to serve? In your life, in your world, in your relationships, in your workplace. What would serving look like for you? Now let's go real practical with this. What does it look like to serve? Well, it really depends where you are spiritually. Think about this. We're all in different places in our spiritual journey. So when I think about teaching the Bible to you week by week on a Sunday, I think in my mind of three categories of people. One category is people who are fully committed to being followers of Jesus Christ. They are committed Christians. They want to align their life by God's uh, desires. They are seeking to grow as a Christian. That is one category, one group. Then there's another group that would raise their hand and say, I'm a Christian but they feel distant from God, spiritually apathetic. They're struggling, maybe, in their spiritual journey. They, they're, they're just not with it spiritually, by their own admission. It's not my view of them, but that's what they would admit themselves. And then there would be a third group. This group doesn't know much or anything at all about God or Jesus. They're, they're here because they're investigating. Uh, they're curious. They're interested. They're checking God out. Maybe you, they were invited by a Christian. They watched somebody else's life, a Christian's life, and they said, you know what, what's different about him or her? Whatever it is, I, I want some of that. I want what they've got. And so you're here checking this whole God thing out. So those are the three types of people spiritually. So why serve? It depends on where you are spiritually. If you're a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ, why serve? Well, you serve <coughs> because that is God's greatest desire for you. When you serve, God forms into you his character. When you serve, God is going, you're getting it. That's exactly what I want for your life. Serving is God's dream for your life. 
That's how he transforms your character. If you're struggling spiritually, or you're spiritually apathetic by your own admission, I would say this to you. One of the reasons you feel distant from God is because your faith has become all about yourself. Your faith has become very self-centered. What am I getting out of this? You've created this distance between you and God. And so serving is the antidote to spiritual apathy. You would feel much more connected to God because you are, if you are serving others. Because you take the focus off of you and you focus on others. If you're not a Christian, you're just checking out this whole Christianity deal, let me appeal to your intellect for just a second. I would suggest that if you look at people who are happy and generous and they look like their life, they're living life at a different pace, if you really looked at them, chances are you would see that they cast a shadow of servanthood wherever they go. They're not perfect by any means, but instinctively you think there's something about these people who serve. And if you are here and you're checking out this whole God thing, let me ask you this question. What do you really want in life? And you know what your answer most probably is? I want love. I want significant relationships. I want peace. I want security. I I want contentment. I want purpose in my life. Now, I can chase that stereotype of a male, but it doesn't lead to what we all really want as men. Or I can do what Jesus says, and I can serve. I can chase and conquer and claw, or I can can try God's way, and I serve. No matter where you are spiritually, if you are checking out God, or if you're struggling, or if you're a fully committed follower of Christ, no matter where you are spiritually, the more you serve, the thirst for living a significant life will increase, because you are wired, you are created to serve. So let me get really practical on what serving might look like for you. How how do you get started? How do you get started in serving others? First thing, start without an invitation. Start without an invitation. Now, what I'm suggesting here is this. Don't wait to be asked to serve. Now, let me talk to married men for a moment. Don't wait for your wife to ask you to help around the house. Ladies, we get the idea of nagging that you just want to completely, continuously remind us of how we should be involved. We understand nagging, whether we take any notice of it is a different matter. But men, don't wait to be asked. Get involved. Take the initiative. Do it. Men around the church, don't wait. Don't wait to be asked to get involved. Say, how can I be involved in building this church and involved in the mission of this church? What can I do? Some of you men are very practical. Some of you men are just good at that stuff. But you hold back. Don't wait to ask to be served. Take action. Step out and serve. And men, if you're not used to serving, as you do it, after a while, here's what it feels like. You'll step back and you go, do you know what? I've stood on the sidelines for so long. I've not been involved in serving others. I've certainly not been involved in serving in the house and things like that. But do you know what? As I've done that, This just feels right. And then in that moment, trust that God is using you to transform you into his dream for your life. Second thing, start small. First, start without an invitation. Secondly, start small. Guys, we need to hear this. A lot of times, we, we like to think big, don't we? We like big. You know, if Jesus served and I've got to serve like Jesus, well, he did all these big stuff, massive stuff. I've got to go big. Right, now, uh, let me just clarify that. Jesus did do big stuff, but he was God, okay? He had the whole divine thing going on that you and I don't have. So since you're not going to turn water into wine or heal a crippled person, why don't you start small? So because I know we men need very concrete examples, let me give you some concrete examples of what I mean by starting small. Ready? First of all, don't be the first to eat. Secondly, stop and help somebody in need. Thirdly, don't hog the remote control and insist on your own television channel. 
Now, I recognize that for some of us men, we need to have that surgically removed from us, but don't hog the remote control. Clean up after yourself. Now, I know this is radical stuff, gents, revolutionary, but clean up after yourself, particularly if you're a teenager, not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> listen instead of talk. And when I mean listen, listen with your eyes. Don't listen in between the adverts of your favourite TV show. Ladies, don't talk to us while we're watching football in the World Cup at the moment, just to help you out with that. <laughs> but listen. Men, listen with all of your senses. Not, yeah, 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 I've got that. Listen. Write a letter or email of encouragement to someone. Fill up her car with petrol when you use it. Put your own laundry away. Uh, you know, I do that every day. All right, once a week. Once a month. Okay, I did it in, once in 1997, but you know. I mean, that's my list. Um, Sarah, my wife, wrote in there, put the toilet seat down. Now, I'm not exactly sure what she means by that, but it's on the list. We start small, is what I'm saying. Small, you see, it's so easy to do. It's so simple, but it's so simple to miss. It, it's the small things that make the difference. And when we do these small acts of service, what we're doing is we're cooperating while God operates on our heart. A life of service begins with the small, maybe even a small prayer that simply says, God, please, will you use me? Matthew 10, 42, this is the major teaching of Jesus, actually, and it really emphasizes the small. Jesus says, he says, if you give even a cup of cold water, now, how small is that? To one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. And that word, be rewarded, leads us on to the third point, which is start anticipating rewards. Start anticipating rewards. Last week, when I talked about humility, I said humility is one of those character qualities that is going to be rewarded. Where pride leads to destruction, the humble will be honoured, the Bible says. That's a part of humility that's going to be honoured and rewarded. The same is true with serving. The result of serving is not only happiness here on earth, but there's also rewards in eternity. John 12, 26, Jesus said, My Father will honour the one who serves me. And circling that verse, the word honour. The humble will be honoured. Those who serve will be honoured. Now, why anticipate the rewards? Well, because you don't serve to get rewards from other people. If you serve, this is really important, if you serve to be recognised by other people, you miss the rewards. You serve with an impure motive. Here's the right motive. I'm going to serve out of obedience what God has called me to do, and God is going to reward me. You're not serving so that you can fill up your, your resume of all the things that I did, or become the humanitarian of the day. You don't serve to get your name in the paper or to be recognised. No, you serve to be obedient to God and you serve to be rewarded by God because God will honour that motive. So he cuts, we cooperate. How do we cooperate? We bow a knee, humility. We lend a hand, service. One more quality. We express our heart, compassion. Compassion. You see, compassion involves the cutting of the heart that moves us to enter into the pain of others. Versus avoid the pain of others, withdraw from the pain of others, or be ambivalent towards the pain of others. Guys, when we talk about this whole natural versus spiritual process, there's, where there's a situation that requires you to become someone different, when it comes to this whole thing about compassion, we all, I think we all have the same battle here. Now, the greatest example of a man showing compassion is to look at Jesus. Because Jesus expresses compassion in the exact way a man should. You see, men, we think compassion's wussy. Just for girls. Women are good at that stuff. Men, no, we buy into this lie that we should be strong. We should be men. But actually, there is, the Bible teaches that there is a masculine compassion that we should exhibit. Jesus shows it to us. Matthew 9, 36, 38. When he saw the crowds, he had, that's Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers into his harvest. Just circle those words in those verses. He saw the crowds. Because that is the first step of compassion. Be moved. Be moved. Jesus let himself look. He let himself see it fully. He let it in. And then circle those words in those verses, he had compassion on them. He didn't short-circuit the visual, the mental process. He let it drop like a bomb in his gut. In fact, that word compassion in the original Greek language means from the gut. He let it get to him. He let himself see it. And then he let himself feel it. That is the first step of compassion. You have to be moved. He let it get to him. And when you see a situation that demands compassion, you need to be compassionate men. Because that was Christ. Let me ask you a couple of questions so you can really get this. Did Jesus see a situation that bothered him? Yes. Did he let it in? Yes. He had compassion on them. Did he solve that situation personally himself in that moment? No. Did he, let, did he act compassionately towards those people? Yes. How did he do that? He expressed his heart. What was inside of him leaked out, leaked out onto the people around him, and he challenged them to participate in the greatest part of the, being part of the solution. He let it in. He indirectly responds. He was compassionate, a compassionate response. He doesn't jump in right away. Now, that's how dangerous men. As men, we may well be moved and we think, okay, well, that's the problem. Here's the solution. Job done, sorted. And actually, we're not moved. And we feel we've got to fix everything when actually at times things can't be fixed. And they don't need to be fixed at that moment. What needs to happen is to show compassion. And that's what Jesus does. He doesn't jump in right away. He says, guys, we've got to pray. We've got to pray that God will bring more help. We can't meet the needs right now. But we've got to pray for more workers to go out into the harvest field that that is dying for compassion and help them. And what this does is it blows up the myth that to be a compassionate, strong fighter for other people, you have to jump in right away. Jesus did not jump in right into that situation. Yet he still responded compassionately. That's the first part of compassion, be moved. But then, secondly, the second part of compassion is where you actually move. Where you actually take some action. You enter into the pain, perhaps, of another person. In Mark 1, 40 to 41, we see Jesus do both things. It says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Now, in Matthew 9... Jesus is moved and he responds, but he responds indirectly. He didn't jump in right away and help, but he asks the guys around him, his disciples, his followers, to pray, and he leaks his heart of compassion onto them. But in this situation, he's moved and he responds immediately and directly. Now imagine a first century leper, a person caught in the politics, the spiritual politics of clean and unclean, and Jesus begins to reach out his strong but soft hand, Can you imagine what's going through the mind of that leper, that guy who probably hasn't been touched for decades because of the culture? The touch just lands right on his shoulder. And that's the first thing that Jesus does. For this man, touch is the compassion of God. Touch is acceptance. Touch is an affirmation of his dignity. And the message to the man is, you have not been abandoned. What does that mean for us? What does it mean for us men today to be moved and then to move? Men, it might mean for the women in your lives, when you see clearly that they are, A, full of concern, B, hurting, or C, sad about something, don't be afraid. Be secure. Be compassionate and enter in and say, that's disappointing. That's hard, that's tough, that's a shame. 
and give them a hug and show compassion. Don't shut them out. Don't walk away. Show compassion. Don't be afraid. You don't have to fix it maybe at that point. Just show compassion. It takes a secure man to be compassionate. Pride and fear keeps a man from entering in. Those of you who are dads, compassion for your kids might mean when your son or your daughter is hurting or or they're sad or they're at a low point or they're struggling or they're conflicted inside, they need love before they need a lecture. They need to know that you accept them and affirm them before they can surrender and soften up, maybe to your authority as the father and the accountability as the father. Maybe there's a person you know that's got some diagnosis, cancer diagnosis maybe. You're their their neighbour. Men, compassion might mean that you take the risky step and you go knock on their door. Don't send your wife, but you go. And you go knock on their door and you say, are you okay? I heard that this was going on. How can I help? How can I encourage you? Can we support you in any way? Or in the workplace, maybe compassion means that you go ahead and uh, and in a risky way you cross over that, that professional and that private zones, you know? Compassion transcends those kinds of barriers. And if you know somebody that you work with and they're hurting Can you or could you or can you go up to them and in compassion say, are you okay? I heard that this was going on. How can I help? How can I pray for you? You see, guys, compassion isn't wimpy. Compassion is very risky. It's very manly. It means coming out of your comfort zone and stretching. Be moved and move. Don't be afraid to enter into the pain of another person, beginning at home, maybe with your wife or with your children or with your neighbours or with your friends or the needs that you see every day. Compassion and tenderness. Tenderness costs us very little, but it accomplishes so much in the lives of those others. When there's authentic men, as real men, we simply have the courage to act in faith. Be moved and then move. Men, allow God to cut and form something new in your life. And if we were to take the actions that I've talked about last week when I said, bow the knee, that's humility, and today, lend a hand, that is service, and express your heart, that is compassion, we'd have a very, very, very different image of what a real man is. we look more like the image of Christ, wouldn't we? Ladies, let me ask you something for a second. If you had your dream of crafting the ideal men, is it somebody that is loud and arrogant and obnoxious and self-centred? Or is, it, is there something about somebody being humble and serving and compassionate that, that, that is intriguing to you? Think about your boys. Think about your sons, your grandsons, that they, would, they could grow up and they could become somebody. What if a man's whole life, his character, his heart and his actions represented these qualities we've been talking about? Life would be so different, wouldn't it? Men's lives would be so different. What they could do and be in their lives if humility and service and compassion characterised their life. You know, there's a principle of life and it is this. What is inside of you eventually will leak out of you. Your character, who you are, will eventually leak out onto other people. The who you are when nobody's looking will ooze out on others. So the question for you is this. When you look in the mirror of your life, what are you leaking? Are you leaking onto others compassion and service and humility? Or are you just leaking the opposite? Pride selfishness, indifference, apathy. These are the biggies. But I know that guys would be up for a challenge. You, you can keep walking the road that culture says a man should be, and there's so many images of what a man should be today. But friends, it leads to a dead end. Or you can take a different route, a different way. One that Christ modelled and one that God has a dream for your life. 
And that road is paved with compassion and service and humility. And while we walk that road, God cuts. He operates while we cooperate with him. And the good news is that if you're sitting here this morning thinking, man, I've got a lot of work to do. The good news is that God is not finished with us yet. 2 Corinthians 3.18 reminds us of this. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him and reflect his glory even more. Men, my final challenge is this. Get to know Jesus well, because the more you know him, the more you will love him. And the more you love him, the more you will follow him. And the more you follow him, the more you will become like him. The more you become like him, the more you become like God's dream for your life. Of what a real man is. Guys, we need to man up. Be a real man, a biblical man, a man of God. Let's pray together. And as we pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I just want you to reflect for a second. Men particularly, but all of us. Just imagine what your life might look like if you leaked out humility. If compassion oozed from your character, if service was one of the things that was part of your life, that you cast a shadow of service everywhere you went, what would your life look like? What would your relationships look like? What would you look like in the workplace? And as you reflect on that, that is God's dream for your life question is, are you willing and are you ready to cooperate? And our Father God, we thank you for today. Just another day to be alive. And thank you that for two weeks we've been able to go after some of these biggies, some of these big areas. And some tough character qualities that us guys have a difficult time embracing. Thank you for having a dream for our lives and that your dream looks so different than the world's dream of what a man is supposed to look like. May we have the courage, may we have the ability to take risks, to be men of compassion, men of service and men of humility so that we might be more like you. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Next week, 